Dr. Lawson is currently focusing on marriage and family ministry at both the master's and the doctoral level. I know that the joy of his life is his sweet wife, Tish, and they have just recently celebrated 50 years of marriage. And so, if you want to see a smile on Dr. Mike Lawson's face, ask him about his wife, his family, or bass fishing. Would you please join me in welcoming Dr. Mike Lawson today? Well, good morning, and what are you doing here? I mean, I'm serious. Uh, 1965, 1965, my colleague, Don Regeer, and I, but we weren't in this room. Their room did not exist. We were in Schaefer Chapel. And I was a new student at Dallas Theological Seminary, and I was answering that question. What am I doing here? All my friends were asking me what I was doing here. Now, for many of you, you come from godly parents and godly friends, and so if you told them, well, God led me to Dallas Seminary, they would know exactly what you were talking about. But my friends had no clue. If I said, well, this was the only thing God would let me do, their eyes would glaze over. There was no comprehension. And in fact, it didn't really make a whole lot of sense to me. I was only a Christian for about a year and a half before we ended up here. I mean, what would make me, the little guy who hated school from the first grade, <laughs> leave a promising accounting career in downtown Dallas and enroll at Dallas Theological Seminary where we had one, count them, one master's level degree. It was four years, or you could do it in four years or even four years. What was I doing here? What are you doing here? Well, we're not the first ones to have to answer that question. The question, the first time I bumped into it in the Bible, actually, is in the Old Testament. Elijah had to answer that question. In fact, it's found right here in my text. It says, and the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah. Now, that all occurred on Mount Horeb. You don't know where that is just yet, but I'm going to tell you soon. At least those of you who haven't been around here a long time. I just wanted to have a little fun with you because I wanted to take you back to a day when I started here. And, and I didn't know anything about this book. And one of my best days, one of my best days on this campus was when I found out this thing had a table of contents. <laughs> Holy mackerel. You could find any book in the Bible that the preacher was talking about with that table of contents. I don't know who invented that, but that was a wonderful, wonderful thing to do. <laughs> so what are you doing here? What was I doing here? What was Elijah doing on Mount Horeb? That was the story. I mean, think about it for just a minute. You have Elijah, you have God. And just the two of them on Mount Horeb, and a simple question from the word of the Lord. Oh, what are you doing here, Elijah? Now, you would think that had an obvious answer, but you probably need to have a little bit of the backstory. Because without the backstory, you don't know why he's there, and actually, maybe what he is doing there, after all. Well, I want to give you the backstory, but I want to do it fast forward. Because everything in the life of Elijah could be punctuated with an exclamation mark. So if you're not ready for this, then buckle up. You ought to wear your seatbelt when you go to chapel anyway. <laughs> buckle up, because we're going to take Elijah fast forward to bring you from where he started to where he is on Mount Horeb. Well, he 
explodes onto the scene. He marches into Ahab's palace and he announces, there'll be no more rain until I say so. Then he marches out. And the word of the Lord comes to him and tells him to hide in Brook Cherith Ravine. And so he goes and he hides there. Then the brook dries up and the word of the Lord comes to him. Hide in the widow's house in Zarephath. So off he goes and hides in the widow's. And why would you hide in the widow's house? Because the word of the Lord said so. Hides in the widow's house in Zarephath. A long time later, the word of the Lord comes to him, tells him, present yourself to Ahab and I will send rain again. And of course, that alone involved a massive undertaking. He challenges the 400 prophets of Baal. He builds an altar to God. He butchers an ox. Have you ever thought of that? He prays fire down from heaven. Now, I have to stop right here. That's my all-time favorite. I don't know how... He qualified for that role. <laughs> but I have been working on it. <laughs> now, I don't need it for a long period of time. I think a month or two I could get it all done out here on 635. <laughs> Just a little fire from heaven, Lord. Oh, my. There'd be less traffic in Dallas. <laughs> They'd be a lot more patient with us out there. He calls fire down from heaven, burns up the altar, burns up the ox, burns up the wood, burns up the water that was there. I mean, we're talking about fire. We're not talking about a little match. We're talking about fire from heaven, for pity's sake. I mean, everybody's eyes must have been bugged out on their cheeks. This was fire. I'm telling you, I wanted that power so bad. Why can't I have it? And then with a little help from his friends, they kill 400 prophets of Baal. He climbs to the top of Mount Carmel, throws himself on the ground prostrate, prays seven times begging God for the rain that he had promised. And finally God sends it and he gets up off of that dirt and he runs from Carmel all the way to Jezreel. And he is waiting for the revival of Israel that they would turn now back to the living God where they belonged. But that is not what he found when he got to Jezreel. There was a death threat put on his life. <sighs> and he didn't know what to do. I mean, these miracles of God and everything that God had done. Why aren't these people believing? Why aren't they turning back to the Lord? And he was just confused, exhausted, disillusioned, overwhelmed. He felt so much alone. So he runs to Horeb. Now he doesn't run all the way. In fact, I'm not even sure he walked the whole way. I think he just kind of shuffled because it took 40 days for him to get about three days worth of walking done. Kind of like the little boy that's going home and he's done something bad. He knows mom and dad's going to really get him. So what do you do? Well, you walk real slow and you kind of kick a little can along the way there and, and uh, think about, hey, you know, what kind of an answer am I going to give? when I get there. And that's where we find him. That's the back story that brings us to 1 Kings chapter 19 where the word of the Lord comes to Elijah. What are you doing here, Elijah? And he replies, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, put your prophets to death with the sword, and I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. And the Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. And then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. And when Elijah heard it, 
He pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood in the mouth of the cave. And then the voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord, the God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, put your prophets to death with the sword. And I'm the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. What an amazing story. This little section has a wonderful uh, symmetry to it. God's question comes first, and then, of course, Elijah's answer. And then there are the three miracles punctuated with commentary. And then there's a repeat of the question and a repeat of the answer. This is a package deal, and it comes together to us with some very important lessons. The first lesson I want you to notice in this particular text is how deeply intimate and personal this encounter is. What are you doing here, Elijah? Do you think the Lord knows your first name? Does he use it when he speaks to you? What are you doing here, Elijah? What is interesting to me here uh, is there no scolding, no reprimand, just a simple question. What are you doing here, Elijah? Notice second that as before, it is the word of the Lord that comes to him. Significant in his life. Uh, If you trace it back through the scenario I painted a little bit earlier, it's always the word of the Lord coming, the word of the Lord coming, the word of the Lord coming. And now, again, it is the word of the Lord coming. But this time, he's asking a question. He's not giving instruction. Does the Lord ever ask you any questions? Have you got some things that you need to answer for? I've had more than my share. I've, I've really not ever been one of the Lord's easy children. I've had a number of these kinds of conversations. Notice, third, that after each of the miracles, the wind, the earthquake, and the fire, the little notation, the Lord was not in it. What an unusual thing to say. What do you mean the Lord wasn't in it? What's happening between God and Elijah? I don't know, but I think perhaps Elijah had come to expect too much from the miracles of God. They're so spectacular, you know. I mean, that's why I'd like to have that fire from heaven. I really would. But they're not the things that draw people to faith. They're wonderful. They're great when God does them. But I think he expected too much. And he was less dependent upon the God of the miracles than the miracles of God. I you to notice fourth in this section. We don't know what God said when he whispers to Elijah. We know everything else. Did you see that? And after the fire came a gentle whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face. And he went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Why don't we know what God said in the whisper? Because it's none of your business. God has some things to say to you that nobody else needs to know anything about. Something so intimate, so personal, so deeply between you and God that nobody else needs to know. That's what went on between Elijah and God.
Last thing I want you to notice. When Elijah was exhausted and confused and disillusioned and overwhelmed and feeling totally alone, he runs toward God, not away from Him. Not like Jonah. When he's just worn out, burned out, completely used every piece of strength that he had, the one thing he gets right is he goes toward God. We do not find Elijah in some bar or brothel in Damascus. We find him on Mount Horeb going to the mountain of God. And for those of you who don't know the significance of Horeb, that was the place where Moses got the commandments from the Lord. He went to the one place that he figured, this is where I will meet with God. I need to have a word with God, a word from God. I love that. I suspect that you're going to feel some of those same emotions while you're doing what you're doing here. You're going to get exhausted. You're going to get disillusioned. You're going to feel really alone. Nobody can help you with that exegetical. <laughs> At least they're not supposed to. <laughs> so where are you going to run? So my lessons for you. As with Elijah, whatever else is going on and whatever else you're doing, this experience ought to be deeply personal between you and God. I've actually spent almost 30 years now on this campus. At the end of this spring, it'll be 30. I've had lots of students coming into my office. And I've had them say strange things to me like... You know, I had a great spiritual life before I came to Dallas Seminary, but when I, I got here, I lost my spiritual life. And I thought, well, the heck you did. Well, what would you do if you lost your car keys? <laughs> you mean you came here and you lost your spiritual life and you didn't stop and look for it? <laughs> what is that about? There are lessons on this campus that appear on nobody's syllabus. They are between you and God, and he is teaching you these lessons. And sometimes he has to squeeze you and push you and shape you and leave you in a position where you have no place else to go but Mount Horeb. Sometimes the Lord may be asking you some questions, not just giving more instruction. I'm not particularly fond of those encounters. <laughs> not just an FYI. As I mentioned earlier, I've hated school since the first grade. I went to my mother. I said, why are we here all day? We can get everything done in about two hours and I can go play. Why are we doing all of this? And that's been pretty much my opinion ever since. So the Lord shoves me into Dallas Theological Seminary where we feed you books like potato chips. <laughs> oh, how delightful is that? And we are paying money to let these people inflict this pain on us? What is wrong with us? What are you doing here? And so when the Lord comes to me and he wants to push me into a doctoral program, I am saying absolutely not. I am already educated beyond my intelligence. I don't need any more. <laughs> What is it about no you don't understand? <laughs> three years, three long years. It got so bad, I could no longer pray without him bringing this issue to my mind. Nothing else mattered between him and me except this. I won't belabor that whole story of what that looked like, but it was an ugly journey. And the end of it was not better than the first of it. 
At the end of it, I had 30 days in which to write my dissertation. I secluded myself in a little cabin on Lake Texoma and became deathly ill. I was so ill that I could not lay on the bed. I had to pull the mattress off on the floor. I called my wife. I said, you have to come get me. I can't even drive home. And so I'm laying there on the floor, knowing that it was God who shoved me into that Ph.D. program. Do you ever speak to God in the vernacular? Don't do it around other people, okay? I mean, <laughs> it just scares the bejeebers out of them. I'm all alone. I'm laying on the floor. I'm so dizzy I can't stand up or lay down on a bed. And I'm screaming at God because I know this is the end. It's not, I'm not going to finish this thing. I am not going to finish my Ph.D. Well, you know, you can say that just so many times and then you finally wear yourself out. And the Lord's really patient. Have you noticed that about him? Yeah, he's, he's, he's almost Southern. You know, he'll, he'll be polite. Just kind of wait for you to, you know, wind it all up. I'm laying there. And I heard this still, small voice. It was not audible. It was more distinct than that. So how did it get to be your PhD? What are you doing here? I can only guess that maybe Elijah expected too much from the miracles, and I fear that you may expect too much from this education. Your T, H, and M, P, H, and D, X, Y, and Z, A, B, and C, or whatever it is that you put behind your name is not going to take care of your spiritual life. And some of you are just starting, so... So you're enamored with it. I mean, I mean, I was. I mean, they're so cool. I mean, you get to learn cool words to impress your friends with. I mean, these are really neat words, and nobody knows them. I mean, they don't even know these in the locker room, you know, in the high school. I mean, nobody knows. Like, hopox legomenon. Ha! Now, there's one for you. Now, if you don't know what it means, but you heard it, and so you want to use it real fast, I mean, you could be saying really silly things like, hey, man, did you hear about the new hot pox legomenon that's, that's breaking out in, in Africa? <laughs> it's a new pox, man. It's really bad. <laughs> or how about this one? Supralapsarianism. See, again, if you don't know what that means, and, but you need to use it really quick, you could say, well, hey, man, are you running any of those super lapsarianism down at the Baylor Center down there? You know, super laps, and then, but it's not what it's about, <laughs> is it? <laughs> Don't expect that knowing these words or getting this degree is going to take care of your spiritual life, your encounter with the living God. Amen. Nothing will substitute for that. Here's the good news. You don't have to wait for the word of the Lord to come to you. We don't do everything right here at Dallas Seminary. We're loyal to this book. We believe these are the words of God. You can trust them. You don't have to wait. Well, <laughs> pretty sick. Look at this, look at this. You got one of these? Yeah. All, you know, when I was a child growing up, we nailed these things to the wall. You couldn't get them off. Whoever invented taking them off the wall, I, I have some fire from heaven I'd like to use on that person too. But anyway, <laughs> we have these things. You got the word of the Lord on it, don't you? Why are you not listening to the word of the Lord? You don't have to wait for it to come to you. You carry it with you in your pocket, for pity's sake. The best news of all. When you're exhausted and confused and disillusioned and overwhelmed and feeling totally alone, 
remember to run toward God. But you don't have to go to Mount Horeb. You see, when the Lord Jesus ascended back into heaven, he threw the gates of heaven wide open. St. Peter's not there because the gates are open. And he sent the Spirit of God to dwell within you. He goes wherever you are. You might be standing on Mount Horeb if you take one of these Israel trips, or you might be standing on a fire ant pile. Now, if you're on the fire ant pile, get off it. Because <laughs> you don't need to be that high to talk to the Spirit of God. He goes with you into any valley. He goes with you to every mountain. Wow. The story of Elijah. What are you doing here? My hope, my prayer for you is that your answer will one day look like this. I am coming to know God more intimately and to love him more passionately so that when I serve him, I will reflect him in all of his beauty and character more accurately. That's what I hope you're doing here. That's what I'm trying to do here. And may God bless you while you discover what you're really doing here. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for stories that are stacked end to end in your Bible that bring to us lessons that we need for our journey. Give us that desire to seek you out to listen to your words and to serve you with great passion. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.